Um, fortunately, I have had to introduce this project to everyone so we know exactly how it runs. Uh, we are going to have two speakers for this first uh, session who will have 10 minutes each to tell their stories. Thereafter, we will engage them in a question and answer session. The idea is to, is to learn, is to share experiences, is to share great moments, is to network just so um, we get to know each other better. And we don't know where this thing is going to lead us to. So we have two speakers today. They are all females. There is Solange Enna Aing, Shuri Achu, who are here with us. Solange is a Cameroonian uh, speaker, public speaker, like she mentioned. She also specializes in responsible relationships. She speaks to the public on common social issues and she advises people on how to build responsible relationships within family circles and you name it. So she's been a resource person on Apex One Radio for a while now and I've had the opportunity to interact with her. Solange is very, very brilliant. I must attest you get to, to find out and she's done quite a lot. Solange also sings. I guess she released an album or a single so many years ago. I don't know if she would like to talk about that as well. Well, uh, that will depend on her. Um, then our second speaker is Shuri. Shuri actually is an internationally acclaimed fine artist and painter with a record number of exhibitions across the world. Uh, you get to find out more when she comes. Uh, on the platform. So I guess um, at exactly 13 minutes past two, let's listen to our first speaker. Thereafter, we're going to engage her in some questions. So Solange Eno, once again, thank you for accepting to be our main speaker on this platform. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Diana. Thank you for having me today. By the way, Solange, you have 10 minutes. Okay, sure. Um, thank you for this, uh, for being a part of this, uh, for inviting me to be part of this maiden edition. I personally, I'm a firm believer in small things. I'm a firm believer in anything starting small. In anything that becomes big, it starts small. So I, I truly esteem this session and I thank you for coming up with this idea so we can talk about this and see how we can go from here. But I believe this can be big someday. It's gonna be big someday. So by, I already introduced myself. My name is Solange Ayuk. I'm from Cameroon, West Africa. I am into public speaking. I'm into coaching, counseling, and um, a little bit of music there <laughs> and a little bit of designing here and there. So I, I do different things. But my main um, calling, I believe, is in public speaking. And um, I started this back in Cameroon. It wasn't um, something I planned to have started. Because I was in school starting to be, <laughs> my parents wanted me to be a nurse or a doctor. So I didn't have any dream for my own self personally. I didn't know what I wanted to become. So I went with their dream for me, thinking that's what I would end up becoming. So I was starting to become a nurse. So I did mostly sciences in school or throughout college and high school. I was more in the science domain. Um, but something happened that made it a huge turn in my life. I was supposed to go to the University of Boya, but I didn't get admission that year. So I ended up finding myself in Yaoundé. And I've never studied in French. I didn't understand. <laughs> and all of, it was so hard for me because I studied all through my life in English. So it was a little bit hard for me. So I dropped out after five months. Um, so I could go to UB the next year. But when I dropped out, my dad had a stroke too. Um, I had, my dad had a stroke during that time and someone needed to stay back to take care of him. And my mom had left my dad at that time. So much was going on. So it was just us, the kids and my dad. And um, I ended up at that point in time in life, I, I was in a point in my life, I wanted to take away my own life. So I kind of felt like my, my life wasn't useful. I didn't feel like uh, growing up, I was always told I, I was useless. I'll never become anything. So I believed it for a long time. I wanted to take away, I wanted to take my own life away. But someone came to me just in time to talk to me about God to talk to me about, you know, the, the, just to, to talk to me about God. And for some reason, I just handed over my life to God and I had peace of mind. And I started up a journey. I was going to their fellowship 
and in this fellowship, they had an institution called a human development institution. And I was attending this school and it started helping me see that I am useful. I have potential. I have talent. I can become somebody. And so because of that, I didn't want to take away my life again. I didn't want to take my life. <laughs> I didn't want to commit suicide anymore. I wanted to leave. I wanted to find out what could be in me that I could offer to the world. And I started realizing that I had this gift of public speaking. And so we sent one time in, uh, to Kumba with two other friends as um, missionaries we've been trained. They wanted us to go out and impact the lives of people. And I went to Apex One Radio speaking for audience to see how I can, I can use this gift of mine uh, that was in me of public speaking. So they granted me audience. I didn't have the money to pay. Um, so, but they gave us one opportunity. And, and during that session we had on the radio, they, they, they were so inspired. They said, you know what? We want to partner with you guys. We're going to bring you in as resource person. So we started working to them as resource person for the radio for free and uh, for, for about two years. And I was using that time just to sharpen the gift that was, that was in me. I just kept sharpening the gift. We would have radio sessions. We could talk on education. We could talk on success. By then, I wasn't talking on relationships. Um, and I did that for about two years. And then I traveled to the U.S. after that a year, then the next year. And coming to the U.S., you know, it's a new ground. <laughs> Many people will tell you, you're not going to make any money in public speaking. Don't even waste your time. And, and, and in the course of doing that, for those two years, I... Um, I wrote a book in the course of practicing and talking and, and sharpening my gift. I, a book was born called Inspiration for Aspiration. So I published that book. It was my first book. And the book made quite a couple of millions in Cameroon. Um, but when I traveled to the US, they told me, forget about all that. It's not going to work here. When you come here, you got to get into the either the IT domain or the healthcare field. And when I came in, I, I struggled with that because I knew that wasn't my passion. But I said, you know what? I got to do this so I can take care of family. And um, but why doing that? I was trying to pursue my passion on the side, and that caused a lot of conflict. It caused a lot of conflict between <laughs> friends and family. They couldn't understand, so we always had this clash between, you know, you just got to pursue this. This is the U.S. That's not gonna work here. And uh, I had to keep journeying. I had to keep journeying that path. And um, with time, I'll talk about some of the challenges. But that's what has brought me to this point. I am today as a public speaker, even though I'm a caregiver on the site, but that this is really my real passion as a public speaker. Thank you so much, Solange. That was um, straight to the point. And uh, someone said your story is really inspiring while you, while you were recounting it. So um, we just listened there to Solange, her, her journey, and that's a summary of it, of course. Um, now, over to us. Um, Solange is um, open to questions. We listened to her story. Um, did that story touch us? Did it inspire us? Do we have um, some clarifications we want her to make? No. But also, who goes first? All right, so um, the floor is open for who would like to, to start. Solange is all yours now. Uh, Solange, maybe I should, I, should, I, sh I should start. So wh why do you think uh, people usually uh, try to discourage, you know, uh, others who have relocated to the United States uh, about their passion, their dreams, uh, you know, and what they did before. So why do you think people do that? Or is, is it that nobody has succeeded in the United States without having to do nursing or IT? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a very key question. I, I think it's just because when we come in many a times, those who have been there ahead of us and, and they've walked this path of nursing and IT or being a lawyer or any of this um, other profession, they have had success in it. And many a times the advice they will give you is according to their experiences. You know, they would feel like, okay, this is where the money is. That's what I was always reminded. <laughs> this is where the money is. So if you want to make money, you got to get in this domain. So I feel it's just because we haven't really put our eyes on other sectors. We haven't really seen people succeed in their passion, which is what my mom always told me, you're not going to make any money doing 
public speaking. You're not going to make any money writing books. Don't bother bringing your first book ever in the US. Don't even bother bringing a copy and so on and so forth. So I think somebody needs to prove that it's possible. And I made up my mind, I'm going to be that person. I said, even if it takes me 10 years, 15 years, I'm going to prove that you can be successful outside of this other borders where your passion truly lies. Because mm. this is a land of opportunity. This is the land of dreams. Dream, any dream can become real, a reality in this country. So that's what I have promised myself. I will keep working as a caregiver, but I must build my dream on the side until it becomes, um, it becomes a, a great success story that I can tell others and you know, show them the way. That's why I love this topic of today because it's very personal to me. <laughs> I can truly point them that it's possible. Don't mm. give up on your dream. Possibly. Every dream can become a reality. Don't give up on your dream. Um, who is next? Any more questions? Okay, I see Sheree is indicating there. So Solange, so even after you your first book sold so many copies in Cameroon, mm -hmm. um, your mother still didn't want you to come and pursue that here. Um, she thinks she wasn't there. She didn't really see the success because I wasn't really telling her much about it because I felt she's not gonna she's not gonna agree to this path I'm walking and so I, I I didn't bother really telling her even when I tried to tell her but she still wasn't really open to me even still after many years we still have that a little bit of you know she still don't she wants you, me to be this you know be this lawyer be this doctor that's what I'm gonna be proud of you for so it kind of feels like, okay, if, if you're not this, I don't really feel like I can really be proud of you in that aspect, even if you're successful. So um, it's really a conflict, <laughs> I'll be honest. It's really a conflict. But as time goes on, I realize she's beginning to open up a little bit more. She's beginning to try to pay attention to what I'm doing because in the, in the years past, she never really wanted to ever care to look at what I'm doing. So I realize she's beginning to open up to what I'm, I'm, I'm doing here yeah, now. Okay, that's great. Any other question for Solange? So, Lange, what does it entail to be a public speaker? Do you need to go to school for it? Please provide tech notes from five six. I would say that's a yes and that's a no, um, because there are courses you can take if you want to be a public speaker. There are courses you can take for that. But uh, I will speak for me in my in my own <laughs> experience. I didn't have to go to school for that because I realized it was a gift in me. And um, it's not, it's, I'm not saying that if there are opportunities for me to, you know, upgrade my talent or my gift, I won't go for it. I will go for it. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I didn't have to go to school to be that. I, I realized it was a gift that God put in me and I needed to sharpen it. I, that's why I spend time, I listen to a lot of other uh, speakers. I listen to relationship coaches. I watch them. So I learn from them. So, uh, but you don't have to. You can as well as you don't have to. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other question? Yeah, I have a question. Like, right what kind of, um, oh, am I mute or is it? No, you guys, no, you no. Okay. Okay. just fix it. Okay. Great. Um, what kind of um, public speaking do you do? Or is there a category to like, um, like public speaking? Is there like a particular category? Uh, or, or also, what, if yes, what kind of um, um, topic or what kind of... Um, yeah, topic that you do. Okay, before when I started back home, I was more into human development, into a person growing holistically, like just having growth in every aspect of your life. If you're successful educationally, you have good morals, you have good character, you have, it was just all about, it was life as a whole. But I realized as time went on, I'm more into the relationship, I'm more into relationship coaching in marriage. So it, has, it, has, it was more like a practice then, but I didn't know exactly what area I was you know, according to, but now it's clear to me that it's I'm according to the relationship in marriage um, a domain of, of, um, of public speaking, which is why I gave, I created a page in 2016 called Relationship Therapy, when I realized that I'm more into public speaking when it comes to better relationship, responsible relationship, treating each other right in a relationship. So I created that page in 2016, and I focused a lot on, you know, relationship and marriage. I talk on other areas, but that's my main area relationship and marriage all right when you started it was like personal development but now it's more of marriage relationship yes yes okay mm -hmm. do you need to have a license for that did you say you have to have a license or um you can like i said you can as, as well as you don't have to um okay. some people go like 
okay, okay, here's the thing. I've been doing this for more than four years. I didn't need to go to school. I didn't need to do any of that because I realized that was my gift. But I, being in the United States, I'm beginning to, because, because when I first came, like I said, I was more into just general development. Um, but when it started narrowing down to the relationship and marriage, I realized that, okay, I could take a course or two to develop um, in, in terms of marriage, being a ma marriage counselor or relationship uh, counselor. So that's what I'm, I am looking at doing. Yeah, but I've already been doing the practical of it for the past, you know, four years since, I mean, four years when I get back to that page, but I've been in the U.S. for more than four years. So. But in time, I would take some courses when it comes to that. But still, I'm still using my gifts when it comes to that because I've been in relationships. I've grown up in relationships, so I have a, some, a lot of experience with her when it comes to that. All right, last question. Do you plan on teaching other people your gifts, um, like pass it on, train other people? Yes, yes. I plan on doing that because that's the goal. You know, they always say success without a success, so it's like it's, it's more like failure. So I, I intend to train other people. Uh, but, but yes, my main goal is helping people to have... Um, to, to be better partners because when you're a better partner the relationship is most likely to you know to be healthy and successful so my goal is seeing people just grow and to 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 generally just grow as a person to make progress as a person you know not just in what we acquire but as a person your human development so we kind that's what i really intend to do i will train people but i want to see people you know practice these things in their relationship and in their marriage so they can have a truly healthy environment to live in because marriage is the base Family is the base of, or is the foundation of the society. And if we succeed there, we can succeed anywhere else. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Vandy, for those questions. Um, so success without a successor is like a failure. I just learned that today. Thank you so much for that, Solange. Um, AJ is trying to find out how you overcame the negative comments from family and friends when you opted to continue with public speaking. And four years down the road, uh, do you still have people making such negative comments about public speaking? Uh, yeah, it was such a tough battle. Um, November will be, be 10 years here in the United States for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a fight. <laughs> it's been a real fight for the past, I would say, I would even say up to the past nine years. It's been a fight, um, a real fight, because it's always been this drag. Like you, you're not gonna make it here. We don't see you. But I just kept going. It was, it was tough. It's hard because one of the biggest challenges I had to face is walking that lonely road. Mm -hmm. Because it's truly lonely when you don't have people who see into your dream or speak into it. I mean, they are not there for it. At least they give you the encouragement to keep going. I had very, little, very few people standing with me. The other majority was like. No, 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 you're a failure and all of this and all of that. But when you're passionate about something, you just keep going, even if you're alone. So this is my passion. So I just had to keep going. I didn't, you know, have to argue with them and all of that. Sometimes it led to arguments. I would, at the beginning, I, I would argue and try to prove a point. But as time went on, when, when people say something, I just laugh. <laughs> I laugh and I just keep going. And I realized see, these same people are beginning to come over to watch what we are doing. They come to my page to watch us and all of that. So you just got to keep going, you know, so it's really tough sometimes, but when you keep going and you finally arrive, the same people who, who, are, who are talking, they'll be the ones clapping for you. So I, I, I just, for me, I, I'm focused. I love what I'm doing. I'm passionate about it. And I'm going to keep going. Right. So um, once you have the passion, it's uh, very easy to keep going. I, um, I can testify to, to that. Thank you so much for joining us, Ngulefak Franklin, you just joined. So um, who has the next question before we run off with Solange and move to our next speaker? Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes. Yes, done it. All right, so I just wanna thank you for, for that short speech and it really inspired me because I'm from Liberia and I started doing journalism from high school. And most of the time people would tell me that I can't continue because number one in places like Africa is hard because journalism doesn't make a lot of money mm -hmm. and journalists are not really respected. So most of the time when I came to the US, most people, some family and friends have always told me to go into nursing and do some other things other than journalism. And I've tried to continue what I'm doing, to continue my journalism, my writing, 
and other stuff. So I just want to ask you, how have you balanced your passion and your work you do in America? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> like I said, for me, what I had to do was just divide the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I even though I'm home at the moment, but I work, I work, and then I, like at night, I would pursue my passion. Or when I have any space within the day, I would pursue my passion. So that's just how I've done it. I, I will always work during the day, and then at night, I will I would pursue my passion. Or if I'm working at night during the day, I'll keep building what I'm building that I'm passionate about. So it was tough. It was really tough to be honest, but I just kept going and I, and I see things, you know, opening up for me. And so you, you just got to keep going, just squeezing the time, just make time. Like Mr. Ennis was saying, you just got to make time for what you love to do on the side. Even if you're pursuing this because this pays the bill fine or so make time for your dream so it doesn't die. You have to find a way to feed it, to keep it alive because if you don't feed it, it's going to die. So that's just what I had. I had to just squeeze time. I had to just squeeze, squeeze. Whenever I have the opportunity, I'm working on my dream. Mm -hmm. All right, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Okay. So um, at some point in time, you thought about harming yourself. Um, what, what one thing that came to your mind? How did you think maybe your family and friends will respond to that? Oof. Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't even think about anything at that time. <laughs> I didn't think about nobody. All I thought was I needed to just put an end. Because here's the thing. I, I had a father. You know, Af our African parents are different in how they discipline us. I don't know. I'm, I can't speak for everybody, but, but for me. Let me speak for me. Sometimes they could say things to you. They don't know. Those words can truly leave with you for the rest of your life. Right. So my dad was fond of always saying, when he's angry with me, he'll say, useless child. Useless child. So he kept saying those things. Useless girl. He would call me things like that and... And with my mom too, she was winning. She was, when I do something wrong, she would, you know, use, she would use she would use words on me that I, I didn't know how powerful words were back then. But when when I wanted to commit to, I realized that those words are so powerful. They can become your reality if you believe it. And since I didn't know who I was, I believed it. I believe I'm truly useless. And and I had aunties when I do something, they would gather for a meeting to rebuke right. me for it, discipline me, but they would never gather to tell me congratulations for something that I did. So that affected my complex. I didn't have enough self-esteem in myself. I, I thought, you know, every time they got, every time they used to call me, I, I, my heart started beating fast. Because I knew, have I done something again? And I, and I wasn't really a bad kid. I wasn't a troublesome kid, you know? But it made me see myself like a nobody. So that, at that point, I didn't care about what anybody would think. I just wanted to end it all. Because I knew, you know what? Nothing good is ever going to come out for me. There is nothing good in me. I'm useless, you know? So I just, I was thinking about just me. I just want to end this thing. I didn't care what they would think when they, if they found me hanging somewhere dead, if they found me in my sleep dead, I didn't care about nobody. It's just all about, let me just end it. Hmm. So um, thank, you. thank you so much, Solange. Thank God. Can I ask the last question, please? Um, okay. One last question, then we get um, the last one from Tina and we move to our next speaker. Okay, so how, how has it affected your parenting skills? Oh, yes, that has changed my parenting skills a lot because I'm a mom of two now. So I'm very mindful what I tell my child when I'm angry because I don't want history to repeat itself. So I realized yeah. what have that much power. So sometimes I'll be, I, I could be angry with my son. I'll say, I want to tell him, you stupid boy. But then I, I think about myself. I think those are the type of words my parents used to me that affected me. And I said, I would hold my tongue. You know, I would hold my tongue. So, and I see God rebuking some, me sometimes when I'm angry to an extent and I, and I say something, God, God himself will rebuke me. I would feel the rebuke, the spirit of God will rebuke me. So I, I realized I it changed my parenting skills a lot in how I discipline my child. Do I discipline him? Yes, but, but, but I wouldn't do certain things like use certain words on him. Yeah, that would deform him for the, for the rest of his life. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to have the last question from Tina, who's, who, 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 who writes, other than God, where else do you draw your strength and resilience from? Um, I would like to say, to me, God is truly the foundation of what I do. And I, when I say that, I don't, I don't say it in a religious, in a religious sense. Hey. I know many times when we say God, it sounds religious, but it, to me, it is more Hold like on. a relationship. So I would say that's the foundation of where I draw my Oh, I'm sorry. What did I do? Uh, am I on mute? Am I mute? Yeah, you're back. Sorry. 
Oh, sorry about that. Okay, I don't know where I, I did stop, but um, I was saying that um, truly my foundation of my strength and resilience comes from God. And when I say that, I don't mean in a religious form. Like, you know, no, I mean in a relationship form because this is who stood with me from when I wanted to commit suicide. You know, God saved me from suicide. I would have been gone more than 15, 20 years ago, but God saved me. So I, I see God not as a religious figure. I see him like a father. Someone who knew the thought in me, nobody else knew. And that's who saved me and gave me an opportunity to be here today, to have a second chance at life. So that is the main foundation where I draw my strength. But many a times, like I said, equally for my passion, when people try to derail me, I tap into my passion, what I truly love. And that's what keeps me going. That's my resilience and my, my, my you know, where I draw my strength from. So my Edda is a motivational speaker. She is a public speaker, of course. We have listened to her story, very inspiring. We would have uh, much time to listen to her more as time goes on. So let's thank you so much for, for that presentation. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome and thank you for having me. You will stay with us while we introduce our next guest. Shiri, actually, like I mentioned earlier on, is an internationally acclaimed fine artist and painter. Mm -hmm. uh, she's done quite a lot. She's traveled across the world with her brush and paint, and she has uh, told she has told so many beautiful stories just using her brush and her paint. Shiri, actually, over to you. You have ten minutes. Hello everyone, thank you for having me on this premiere. Um, um, where can I start with art? So I started painting when I was nine, when my parents took us to, from Cameroon, so I'm Cameroonian, and they, they took us from Cameroon to England. And then I, I had this desire to paint. I don't know where it came from, but I knew that I had to paint. And fortunately for me, um, Solange, my mother was very encouraging. She, she got me to, to practice, she bought my materials, she, she um, got me teachers to teach me perspective. She, you know, she did a lot for me to, because she's also quite a creative. So she wanted me to, you know, pursue um, what, I, what I love to do. And I didn't just, I didn't like to just sit around and do nothing. So it was for something for me to be at least doing. So I started painting. Throughout you know school, I was always painting. Throughout university, I decided to go and do architecture. So I I went to architectural school, and there I was still painting. Um, and then I finished architecture, became an architect, but I still wanted to paint. So again, my desire, my passion, is always keep driving, keep coming up. Okay, no, you have to paint. I have. Um, I wanted to in Cameroon, in London. I realized that people didn't really know much about the African culture. They only knew the Maasai. And I'm like, why? Well, I was watching that just now. I was, I, I was always wondering why, why don't these people know any more about the African culture other than just the Maasai? So I, I thought, okay, I'm going to have an exhibition. My very first exhibition was 11 years ago. Um, I titled it the, the 30th Act, and in that exhibition, I decided to paint other cultures. I painted the Cameroon culture, men wearing Togo. I painted the Yoruba culture. I painted, you know, weddings. I painted, I didn't paint the Maasai because I actually do love the Maasai. There is a reason why people love the Maasai. They are a great tribe. Um, so I, I, I said that the aim was that I wanted to now showcase Africa culture so that people can start knowing more about the beautiful Africa culture, not, not just the Maasai. So I, I decided, okay, God downloaded to me that, okay, what you have to do now is travel every year to a new country and exhibit. So people get more familiar with the cultures. So um, I started with the, 35, the 35th in print exhibition, which was seven years ago in London. And then I did the 36th in print exhibition, which um, here in DC, I did 38 in print exhibition in Australia, I did 39 in print in Jamaica, then I did 39 in print in Toronto. I know these numbers, they're increasing, but they're, they're the number of works, uh, pieces that were in each exhibition. So the aim is that every year I travel to a new country and expose. So it gives me so much joy when someone in Australia, for example, gets to learn about Bafutu. They get to learn about Achu. They get to learn about, and they actually buy the pieces and put in their house. And then they can explain to their friends, oh, this is the culture in Bamenda or in, you know, in Nigeria or in Ghana. So 
Um, I did the 40th act, which was my 10th year anniversary of exhibition around the world. And then this year is the 41 in Prince. I don't know whether you've seen it somewhere, live flown around. It's, it's a worldwide virtual exhibition because I have not been able to travel to do um, an in-person exhibition. So this one is virtual. And actually it's, um, I think today's exhibition has finished. So we have two more days of this exhibition. It's actually currently running. You can see it on my webpage or you can see it on my Facebook or YouTube. So you, um, so two more days of, and then the exhibition will be over. Um, so that is that is what I do. I, I love to showcase Africa culture um, because it's beautiful. And I am proud of being Cameroonian. People always ask me, why are you so proud? Like you grew up in London. Um, God put it in me to love, you know, to love my culture and love to show to the world. So, and I always want people to be proud of who they are. Like there's nothing you can do about being who you are. So be proud of it, you know, own it and, and, and just, you know, and proclaim and love being who you are. Um, and I've had a great amount of support from my family. So I feel very blessed because in my journeys, in my, you know, in my quest to do what I'm doing, I've had, you know, some support. My, my, it's the financial support that, you know, obviously is always going to be lacking, but, you know, I, I think I, I'm, I'm doing what I can to, to do what my heart tells me that I must do. What else can I say? Um, yes, it's very tiring because I am a full-time architect, um, but despite that, I sometimes sleeping at four o'clock in the morning because I have to get this painting out or because I have to do an exhibition, um, I hardly sleep. But I don't, like Solan said, when you have a passion and, you know, you, you can carry on and do what you have to do. Has that been 10 minutes? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sheree. That was a great, great story. She started at the age of nine and she has covered a great distance, traveling across the world to, 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 to share cultures, not only hers, but other people's cultures to the rest of the world. There could be nothing as wonderful as, as, as that. So thank you so much. All right, so it's time to, to quiz her. Um, I will begin, then the rest will follow. So Sheree, you also uh, said um, you are an architect as well. Is there any relationship between architecture and fine art? Yes, they are, they are connected because they're both very creative. Um, what I have, I can be very, so in architecture, when you have to be very precise, you know, you can't make any mistakes. Art gives me that freedom. So the juxtaposition between the two of them is great because one, one focuses me on design and okay, spaces and you know, a different aspect of this creative space. And then this other one, the art side, allows me to drink champagne and just, you know, be free and loose. <laughs> so they're, they're a great combination. Right. So, great combination, architecture and fine arts. So, who is next? Any more questions for Shuri? Yes, I could go next. Yeah, right. I do have a question, um, Ennis. All right, Shuri, um, so how do you handle it with um, being an African person, right? I know we find it very difficult in the, out there, especially being an architect, how do you handle it? That's why I handle being an architect. Or not. As, a, as, as an African uh, working in the United States as an architect, because uh, not many Africans, um, are architects, you know, practicing the profession here in the United States. So how do you sail through? Um, do you know, I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Because I grew up in London, I don't see color really i don't see that there should be any difference in 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 me being a fit or being a, a a black or african architect i just know that it's something that i went to school to do i did it and now i'm working in it um i don't i don't experience luckily for me i don't experience the um the racism or any tonight comments that you know, other people, you know, receive at their workplaces. Mm. I, I, I feel like I, I belong in the practice that I work for. Oh, and also when I, especially when I, when I'm an artist and I'm exhibiting, 
I feel like, okay, well, no, like the people who actually buy my work in a lot of Caucasians, they, they, they appreciate and they would buy my work and they appreciate the fact that of course I am a, an African person and I dress and you will know that I'm African. So I, because I celebrate this thing, these things, you know, I, I never feel um, any, any negativity around it. Right. Okay, beautiful. Um, Grace Dunlap, you had a question. Okay, I don't know if we've lost her. So, <laughs> oh, I think I had a question as well. Okay, go, go right ahead, Solange. Okay, oh, Charita, that's such a beautiful story. <laughs> such a beautiful story. And um, to have your parents or your mom this support you for your gift, that is amazing. You know, she was able to, from the very foundation of it, to, you know, buy you the stuff that you need to, so you can truly pursue this. So uh, that's such an inspiring story. I just want to ask you, um, as an, um, like, okay, the question I wanted to ask first was, okay, is this something that you realized was a gift in you or you had to study to be this, to be an actor? I, I mean, okay, in this, the gift, I think is the art because mm -hmm. I woke up and I just knew that I had to paint. It was just something that I, I felt like I needed to paint. I, and my brother tells me that I found the materials in the, in the backyard. Like who goes and finds materials in the backyard and starts to paint? Apparently that was my story. I can't recall how I ever got my first paintbrush and paint, but my brother told me that, oh, you found it in the backyard somewhere and you started using it to paint. I'm like, okay. So God placed it there somehow for me <laughs> to go and find to use. Right. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I, then I went to study architecture because I also, I, I knew that I was always going to paint. So I, I also wanted to, in, during you know, my younger years, I was, I was good at school. And I wanted to, and I, my uncle was an architect and I wanted to also go and learn a craft. And in fact, the opposite story, my mother told me, why are you going to do architecture? Just stay and be an artist. Quite the opposite to you, Solange. Just don't, don't go and, you know, I think it's because it was a seven year course and she didn't want to have to put me through the whole seven years. But she was like, nah, just stay and do art. And I said, no, I want to go and do architecture because I knew I was always going to do the art anyway. So that's, yeah. So the art, the, the art, I think, is, is something that comes from within that God had placed me to do. Um, and then the architecture is something that I, I wanted to do. Okay, one last thing. What are the challenges you face along this um, career path you've been on? What are your challenges? Um, in art, it's... Um, now, the, ex the exhibitions that I do, they're very tasking to have to produce 35 pieces and frame them and carry them to a new country and exhibit and the promotion. For me, typically it's promoting and making the sales. Um, and typically when I would have an exhibition, yes, I'll make sales, but um, sometimes um, like this virtual exhibition has, you know, has been very expensive, but, you know, I'm waiting on the sales to come. So I, I'm finding that um, this, the, you know, the, what I'm wanting to receive financially is, but in fact, there was a time when I gave up architecture just to focus on art. And I found I wasn't able to survive like that. So I had to go back into architecture um, so that, you know, that could help me with the art. But despite it, I mean, I don't complain. I don't mind having to spend what I have to do in order to do my art, but it will be good if, you know, I can start having, you know, a lot more um, sponsors, a lot more help. And I know everyone tells me that I should have you know, I should have assistant, I should have all this. But of course, that means, you know, I have to have, I have to pay these people, you know? So, so it's, it's a fine line between um, how big I can go without having to get assistance. And of course, when you have assistance, you have to pay people. Um, so it's, as I mean, artists always, it's, it's always the same story with artists when you have to, when you struggle a little bit, but um, when you have your passion, it's okay. You can, you can keep going. Great. So earlier we had Solange uh, say that she had uh, a lot of negative remarks coming in when she just relocated and had to pursue her dream. So, um, what was what was what was your case? Did you have people who also made such comments vis-a-vis uh, -vis fine arts? Because uh, if you are not doing Nelson, if you're not an IT uh, person, then you're not making it. So what were people saying about fine arts? Um, well, 
nobody could dare bring me IT or next thing to me because I'll look at them very funny. <laughs> because you can tell that's not my that's not my domain. Um, with fine arts, um, they they know that, you know when you see that somebody has a passion for something, you cannot. There's nothing that you can really tell to deter them. You know, you can try and say, well, you should do something else. You know, just in case. And luckily, because I was doing something else just in case, there was really not much, you know, they could really tell me. I could, I could go and do what I wanted to do because I was also doing architecture. So I did not have too much um, negativity regarding my architecture, thankfully. And I see a question <coughs> from Grace. Should I take it? Yes, go ahead. How do you prepare for a new project? What's the process like in prepare, preparation for new projects? Ah, great. Grace, you are in, where are you again, Liberia? She's in Ohio. I'm She's from Liberia. Liberia, but. You're, okay, you're from Liberia, but you're in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. So um, my new project could be Liberia. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. I, I, um, I have wanted to go to Liberia. Um, so maybe my next, my next exhibition will be in Liberia. And um, I'll contact you since you're a journalist later on just to find out how you know we can do the promotion of the exhibition then. Um, but typically um, I would, I would, so the next exhibition that I'm having would be 41, 42 in print. 42 in print um, will be sometime within this year. And it will be in, luckily because the whole COVID thing, I should be able to travel and do the exhibition now um, one, to, one on one, not the virtual exhibition. Um, I will be traveling to a new city and it was either going to be Tokyo or Liberia. So one of the two. And um, so I'll be having 42 pieces at that exhibition. I will have to curate and select those pieces that I want in the exhibition. I will make them as limited edition prints so that they, are, so they become affordable and they are transportable. And then, you know, hopefully people can buy them because, and then I leave those paintings in the country to the people who purchase them. So that's, that's the whole process. So I, I, I have already a bulk of pieces, but I'll make a few new pieces, which I will take into the exhibition. Um, and then, you know, it's all about promoting, um, having people come to the exhibition and sales and, and then wrapping up the exhibition. Okay, I guess um, we are just six minutes to go. We are about to run off. Uh, one of uh, the reasons why we are creating this platform is also to let people interact and know each other and even work, um, you know, with each other eventually. So um, that said, Sol uh, Solange and Shuri, you're going to leave your contacts so that the rest of the team can, can have them. Maybe should you do that um, in the chat box? I guess that would be that that, that would be great. So, what, what uh, contact would you like? Sorry, the email address or phone numbers? Email and and and, and phone number. Emails or, and phone numbers. Or if you have any social platform that one could follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Then just to just to say that we have many other people on this platform who do many things, uh, including uh, Frank Zuru, who is a comedian. These stories will be told eventually. So this is just the start of it. Today is day one. We are just testing the grounds to see how this can take us uh, um, to. So I want to thank everybody. I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> Uh, for the last thing. So, uh, tell me if you can see my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yeah. sir. Right. So, um, if you can see my screen, I just want to appreciate everybody for coming. And uh, usually, usually, um, seminar participants don't go home with empty bags. If they are not getting money in their bag, at least they are getting appreciation, okay? So uh, today I want to appreciate those who took part in this um, in this uh, first session. So these are your certificates. Eventually we will be sending out certificates dig digitally, of course. But so these are your certificates. We had a call on who participated. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a pioneer. So uh, whoever took part in this first edition, you are a pioneer. So we all started this. It is your thing. Uh, 
thank you so much. Congrats, uh, Tina Nanova. You were part of it. Uh, thank you for taking part in this first edition. Thank you so much, Delta Fonjong. You were part of it. Uh, congrats for being a pioneer. Thank you, Franklin Gulefak. You are a pioneer of this. Uh, it was wonderful having you. Congratulations. So, thank you so much. Congrats for being a pioneer. Congrats on being a pioneer of TPW. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Then, AJ, thank you so much. Congrats for being uh, on being a pioneer uh -huh. of this initiative. You were part of us today. Uh, Atem Akem was part of us as well. Thank you so much uh, for participating and congrats on being a pioneer. Maxel was there as well. Maxel, thank you so much. This is a certificate of participation. Uh, you are a pioneer of this. Solange was our very first, first speaker and that goes into the annals. Solange, thank you so much and congrats on being a pioneer. Same to you, Achu. thank you so much for being um, one of the pioneer speakers and that has gone into record as well. Howada to Koroma, thank you so much. You are in Maryland. Uh, you've been part of it as well. Congrats on being a pioneer of this. Um, thank you so much, Grace Danlet. Uh, congrats on being a pioneer as well. We also had Mr. Iwakna Lee, the Ohio Media School, um, with whom we do a lot of um, collaborations here on Apex One Radio. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee, and congrats on being a pioneer of this initiative. So, like I said, this is just the start of it. We don't know where it is going to take us to, but uh, with conviction, um, I believe it's going to take us somewhere. Let's all watch and see. I will announce the next edition of um, our seminar, and uh, we will all get back here to listen to to, to more stories. So at exactly 2.58, um, we are running off. So thank you, everybody. I, I can't appreciate you enough. Uh, do have a fantastic rest of the day. And when we are meeting uh, for the next session, please come up with ideas. This is just a start of it. We can improve. We can bring in new concepts and see how it, uh, it looks better. There is room for, for improvement. We can only get better. So thank you once again, and may God bless all of you.